Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, next part of uh, our uh, summer semester and uh, season for uh, mathematical physics under the name Prague Seminar for mathematical, mathematical physics. And uh, it's our great, great pleasure that uh, we can welcome uh, on the spokesman floor our next speaker. Uh, he's uh, that Heller from uh, CIC. Uh, IECO <laughs> from Kaiko. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Or Psycho. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Physical Institute uh, of Academy of Science uh, in Prague. And uh, Ted is going uh, to tell us uh, something uh, what uh, he remembers. Uh, surely, but uh, uh, it. Uh, Oh, it's a, a topic. Today I was asked to talk about this preprint, uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple result. And uh, things I'm going to say are pretty today are pretty simple, so um, so people can relax a bit. Um, okay, so we start by. So in general relativity, we have this Einstein-Hilbert action. Which is a functional metric. And if we set the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action to zero, this just gives Einstein's equations. So this condition, determines uh, physical space times. In general relativity. So uh, in string theory, we have kind of an analog or a generalization. Uh, let's see how we Uh, we have something analogous. We have some action, which uh, is a functional of the metric, since uh, string theory is gravitational theory. And in addition, uh, it, uh, it depends on the other fields that appear in string theory. So if you have, uh, say, bosonic string theory, you could have a tachyon. We also have anti-symmetric tensor and a dilaton field and uh, an infinite list of higher spin massive fields. So in string theory, we have a Lagrangian like this or an action like this. Dilaton. And this is uh, metric. Tachyon, so it's kind of uh, string theory of tachyons. Um, and this action uh, defines what, uh, what's called uh, closed string field theory. So, um, so in this action, we, we also have variational principle. And this determines some um, field equations for all the fields, the infinite list of fields in string theory. And the solution of the field equations determines uh, the physical backgrounds. Of 
of string theory. So uh, we have an action like that in string theory. No, it's not as easy to manage as uh, Einstein Hilbert action in general relativity. So there's a long standing question in the subject, which is uh, what is the value of the string theory action, the closed string field theory action, on a string background? So the, uh, this is a long-standing question, and the result of this preprint is that uh, the action vanishes uh, for compact string, string backgrounds. Okay, so that's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it is that uh, uh, the action vanishes uh, up to possible contributions uh, from the boundary of space time. And it's some just a terminological question. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean by uh, compact string background? It, it means uh, uh, it means it's a compact manifold. Yeah. It's a compact. Uh, so it's a compact. Uh, pseudo Riemannian manifold, uh, okay, in addition to whatever other fields are on the background. Okay, so, so the whole uh, space or space time uh, is compact, okay. including the, the time direction potentially. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it can have, uh, can, it, can it have boundary? It can have boundary. Well, if it has a boundary, yeah. then it's non compact. So if there's a boundary, Okay, then it's uh, then this was then then you can have uh, boundary contributions. <laughs> so um, so um, so that is the result. Okay. Um, So, um, uh, so the action vanishes up to possible boundary contributions. Okay, but uh, um, in flat space time, uh, it is believed. That the action that the action really does vanish. Okay, okay but there, in in principle, uh, there's there are certain backgrounds where the action uh, might not be zero. Okay, uh, for example, uh, strings of media is three. So in principle, it's possible that if you have a non-compact space-time, this action can be non-zero. But uh, um, not much is really uh, 
understood about this question in the general case. So people really don't know what the action on non-compact string theory backgrounds should be. So this somewhat contrasts with the situation uh, when you consider uh, backgrounds for the open string. So uh, for example, um, D-brains, okay. So the D-brain action, uh, there's very clear conjectures about the relation between the D-brain action and uh, D-brain tensions. So there's no corresponding uh, understanding for closed string backgrounds. Um, and the result of this paper doesn't really tell you what happens in the interesting cases. It just tells you what happens in the uninteresting case when, uh, when the uh, background is compact. But okay, this is, uh, this is uh, maybe, uh, I think this is an important step in the right direction. Um, okay, any, uh, any other questions? Okay. So, um, okay, so, so this result follows okay, in a rather simple way from the fact that uh, the uh, coupling constant in string theory is dynamical. So, um, okay, so the coupling constant in string theory is uh, what determines uh, the strength of the interaction of three closed strings. Okay, so we have three closed strings that are interacting. This amplitude will be proportional to the coupling constant, which I mean is count. Um, and if you have uh, several strings interacting, so I only have a lot of strings interacting to some endpoint amplitude. A lot of strings interacting. And you can you can view this uh, this interaction as generated by a sequence of cubic interactions like this. So you can imagine this is corresponding to some Feynman diagram that looks like this. And each node of this of this uh, diagram uh, should correspond to a cubic vertex. Um, and therefore, some power of the string coupling. So, in this way, you you can see that uh, the endpoint string amplitude should be proportional to kappa to the n minus t. Okay. So, um, so it appears that this coupling constant is just some number, which is an input into the definition of string perturbation theory. But uh, the claim in string theory is that this number is actually determined by the dynamics of the string. So the uh, uh, the way this is is argued, you can see this by analogy to uh, the space time background where this where these strings are are moving as some metric, and this metric would also a priori appear to be an input and the definition of the perturbation theory. But in string theory, you see that this background metric is actually a dynamical variable of the theory, because if you look at the quantum states of the string, one quantum state is the, is the graviton, which tells you uh, how the shape of space-time can be deformed by the string. And in uh, 
So there's a, an analogous uh, quantum state of the closed string, which is uh, the constant mode of the diloton. And the constant mode of the diloton uh, changes the Kaplan constant. So no, we're we're just doing three level. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this is a three level, a three level diagram. So this is a point sphere amplitude. So if you have loop diagrams, in fact, this power of kappa can be different. Yes. No. It's determined by the other characteristics. Um, but actually, uh, okay, in our talk, the reason why I'm focusing on the sphere amplitudes is because this action of closed string field theory is a classical action, okay? In particular, uh, when we are evaluating the action on a background, that's, this is a, the on-shell value of the action, this is a classical statement. So this is a statement that is meaningful at the level of string tree level or, or the sphere. So for this talk, all we care about is the sphere. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so, okay, so the fact that the constant mode of the diloton state of the closed string changes the coupling constant, this is a uh, a statement that is usually understood at the level of uh, the uh, string effective field theory, but the most precise statement, uh, articulation of this statement is in closed string field theory. So the statement is a, is a, result, is a result of Bergman and Zwiebel. Um, so, um, the, um, the statement is that, uh, is that shifting the constant mode of uh, the diloton in the uh, closed string field theory action and performing Uh, a homogeneous field redefinition uh, adjusts the coupling constant kappa in. Uh, in the uh, in the closed strength of the reaction. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, okay, so, okay, so let's, uh, let's make this a little bit more precise. So the closed string field theory action can be written like this. There's a quadratic term. Cubic term. Um, vertex term. Okay. Um, and so on. So the action is non polynomial, where phi is the closed string field. So the closed string field is an element of some gigantic vector space. And this vector space includes as components. Uh, The tachyon metric fluctuation, uh, anti symmetric, <laughs> anti symmetric <laughs> tensor, and uh, the doton. And an infinite list of other fields. So all of these, uh, all of these different fields that you see in string theory are uh, incorporated in this gigantic object, which is the closed string field. And uh, the action looks like this. There's a kinetic term for the action, which uh, which is quadratic in the closed string field. And as usual in quantum field theory, this represents the free propagation of the closed string. And we have a cubic vertex coupling three closed string fields. And uh, as mentioned earlier, with this thing, this thing should be proportional to the coupling constant kappa because the three string interactions proportional to the coupling constant. We in principle will have also a quartic vertex between the closed string fields. And this should come with a Coupling constant kappa squared because uh, um, this, should con this vertex will contribute to the four point amplitude, which is proportional to kappa squared, and so on. Okay. So, um, so we can simplify this deleton dependence in the action by redefining the string field. We just take what's phi, which is written up here, and we replace it by one by kappa phi. Okay. And then all these powers of kappa in front of the vertices will cancel out. And the dependence of the action on the on the coupling constant uh, appears only as a factor of one over kappa squared. Okay, so um, so the statement that the uh, that the uh, coupling constant can be changed by a shift in the dilaton in this language uh, can be expressed by as follows. Um, Um, so, uh, 
All right, so there's a uh, there's an infinitesimal transformation. Of, uh, of closed string fields, which takes the form is uh, some function of phi, okay, such that uh, the following relation holds. Um, Evaluate the action and we change uh, the string field a little bit in this way, then this will be equal to one plus epsilon of the original action. Okay. So uh, so uh, so because the action depends on the coupling constant. As an overall normalization out in front, the existence of a delta phi satisfying this equation is just saying that uh, we can change the coupling constant by redefining the string field. Okay. So uh, this delta phi, okay. Delta phi can also be expanded in powers of the string field. And it has a constant in homogeneous term, which we write as D. And this is the constant mode of the deleton. And then there will be uh, a uh, there will be a term which is linear in the closed string field, a term which is uh, quadratic, and in general, uh, it's uh, this continues. There's a homogeneous curve. So uh, this shift by the constant mode of the dilaton is really physically what changes the coupling constant uh, in the action. Okay. These additional contributions, this homogeneous field redefinition, okay, is not really physically necessary, but what it does is, uh, okay, so if you didn't include these terms and you just changed the string field like this, um, well, you would find on this side of the equation would not be the same action, okay? It would be a physically equivalent action with a slight shift of the coupling constant, okay? So the closed string field theory action is not unique, and there are many representatives. Uh, so in order to uh, shift the dilaton and get back to the action that we started with, we have to we have to additionally uh, perform some uh, some field redefinition. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so that uh, this equation holds with this action being exactly the same action as the one which appears on that side. So we think we So essentially what this is saying is that the doton shift changes the coupling constant. And this stuff just ensures that it, that it doesn't change anything else unphysical about the, about the action. Okay. So, the observation of the paper is simply that uh, that if uh, I, if our closed string field satisfies uh, the equations of motion, uh, then uh, S of phi plus epsilon delta phi will equal s of phi because it's a stationary it's a stationary point of the action okay but then if you compare that to this 
equation where we have one plus epsilon. We learn that the action vanishes on shell. Okay. So that is really just uh, that is really the result of this uh, of this preprint. <laughs> um, so okay, so it's a, a little bit simple. Um, but uh, okay, so earlier I was mentioning that there is a uh, condition on this uh, on this result, which is that uh, we have to be thinking about a target space which is uh, compact. Okay, and the reason why this is important is because uh, uh, this variational principle that the action should be uh, stationary. Okay only holds for variations which vanish is generally you only require that it's holds for variations which vanish at the boundary of your space time okay but uh, a constant shift of the dilaton field the constant mode of the dilaton does not vanish on the boundary of space time so in principle uh for uh, string theory backgrounds, we do not require that the action is stationary with respect to a constant shift of the dilaton. And for this reason, uh, this result only applies on compact string backgrounds. The other implication is that on non-compact string backgrounds, uh, the only way this thing can be non-zero is due to contributions from the boundary of your uh, of your string background. So uh, this is now all that I explicitly prepared to say. How much time do I have? Do I have? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. We're still we still have twenty minutes or so, so I can I can maybe uh, I think I've I, I've explained everything that is really all the ideas that are really physically relevant to uh, to the main point of the paper. So I can um, uh, go go a little bit further into how this. Uh, how this statement looks from the point of view of uh, more detail, how it looks from the point of view of string field theory. Uh, um, but as you can see, you don't actually need to know much about the nature of the string field theory action to see that it's true. Okay. Um, So, uh, okay, so we can, okay, so, so let's give some more details on uh, closed string field theory action. Okay. So the action of closed string, the formulation of the action uh, requires a grade a uh, z graded vector space which is basically the vector space of string fields with the closed string field. Okay, and in addition, it requires a cyclic L infinity structure on this vector space.
So this cyclic L infinity structure, okay, let's call this vector space so H. Uh, this cyclic L infinity structure is defined by a symplectic form, which maps two copies of H to numbers. Okay. And it requires a sequence of string products. Uh, the first being uh, what's known as the RST operator. And then there's a two string product which maps two copies, two string fields into a string field. And a three string product which maps three string fields into a string field. Okay. And so on. Okay. Okay, such that uh, the symplectic form and the string products LN satisfy the relations of an L infinity algebra. So, uh, So the closed string field theory action is characterized in a slightly more specific way in terms of this algebraic structure. And the action that I wrote before can be written as, okay, let's keep the uh, one over campus square out front because that's one view that is useful for us in the end. So you have the symplectic form and uh, phi q phi. This is the uh, quadratic part of the action, which describes the free propagation of the string. You have a cubic vertex, which is defined by the product of two strings. Okay. And in general, there are an infinite number of these string products and an infinite number of these string vertices. And, uh, and uh, these string products uh, uh, define the cyclic L infinity algebra, which means that these vertices are cyclic in the appropriate sense. And the L infinity relations can be expressed. Okay. Uh, in terms of the symmetrized tensor algebra. And the symmetrized tensor algebra or vector space of closed string fields can be expressed by a co-derivation. And you can write as L, which is the DRC operator plus two string product plus three string product plus etc. This is now defined as an operator on the symmetrized tensor algebra, which squares to zero. So this is uh, this is the algebraic formulation of closed form field theory in a little bit more detail. And this relation uh, for that we have an L infinity algebra guarantees that the closed string field theory action has a certain gauge invariance, which uh, generalizes the general coordinate invariance of general relativity and the abelian gauge invariance of the anti-symmetric tensor. Uh, in a way which is appropriate to string theory. So the closed string field theory action has a gauge invariance. Um, and uh, okay, so then uh, recall that, uh, okay, so that is our, our action. And now we can describe uh, the, uh, this uh, this transformation phi 
which uh, changes the doaton, which shifts the doaton and, uh, and changes the coupling constant. So that is given by D plus U1. The U1 can be regarded as a one string product. U2 can be regarded as a two string product. And then an infinite number of other products which appear in this field variation. Okay, so now this uh, D is a map from numbers into a string field, and the string field is just the constant of the doton. U1 is a map from, is a linear map on the uh, closed string vector space. U2 is a product of two string fields. So it's another string field and uh, U3 and so on. Okay. So these products can also be packaged into uh, into a co-derivation on the symmetrized tensor algebra. H. Okay. And this uh, co-derivation we can just write as U. It starts with the, uh, the constant mode of the doton plus the one strain product plus the two strain product and so on. Okay. So um, so earlier we uh, we uh, argued that uh, okay that there is a delta phi which satisfies uh, this relation for the closed string field theory action. But if you trend and this relation translates into an algebraic relation between the string products of your closed string field theory and the string products which are define your field variation. Okay. And in terms of the semitrace tensor algebra, this relation is simply that the L infinity structure is given by the commutator of itself with U. Okay. So this is kind of a funny relation. Uh, somehow says that uh, the L infinity structure is trivial in its own little modi. <laughs> So uh, this is a, a weird fact about string theory, which follows from the fact that the coupling constant is not uh, dynamical. Or sorry, the coupling constant is dynamical, okay? So in general, you wouldn't expect to find a relation like this for a generic L-infinity algebra, but it is realized in closed string field theory. So, um, Okay, so there's certain algebraic, okay, so uh, um, there's a certain uh, algebraic uh, manipulation, which I did in this uh, preprint, which showed that the action is written up there can also be written as one by kappa squared times the inner product of uh, and this relation implies that the uh, action can be written as the following in a product. Uh, Okay. 
the Q disappeared somehow. Uh, Q? The Q that the R is the operator is in here. Uh, the Q is in, is in L, it's the, it's oh, the first term in L. Yeah. So you could write it as L1, but in physics, we always just write it as Q. Is it our ansatz or uh, just the theory? This uh, follows, well, what was shown in this preprint is that this relation follows from the standard formulation of the closed string field theory action and this relation. So in some sense, if you plug this relation into that action and you do some algebra, which is not completely trivial, um, you will find that, uh, that you can write the action like this, okay? And so the important point here is that this piece, this is the, uh, these are the field equations. Of close string field. So if the equations of motion are satisfied, this thing will be zero and the action will be zero. So, uh, so in this way, the vanishing of the action, which you can really see, uh, you don't need all this technology to see that, but here with this uh, with this technology, you can see that it. That it comes out uh, quite, uh, quite directly. Uh, uh, so, so uh, is, there, is there more that I want to say? Um, so, okay, so. So maybe uh, I, I can try to say a little bit more about why this is important. So if, if it stops, right? It's just the it's the complete action. So there is no dots in that. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Oh, the only if these products continue forever. Okay. So. Uh, so there's a yeah. dot 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 there and a dot 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 there. Yeah. Uh, so this requirement that we need a proper space time without boundary, uh, how does it enter in this in this derivation of the statement? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so presumably in this derivation you have to integrate by parts or something. Okay. So you you use formal algebraic relations mm -hmm. uh, when which you will always assume to be true when you're doing when you're computing with homotopy algebra. And if you look in details to the explicit realization of these relations, some of them are going to involve integrating by parts, which could generate boundary terms. Okay, uh, and those boundary terms might not be zero. Okay, but in practice, actually understanding this seems really I don't it seems really difficult because. Uh, yeah, so um, okay, that is part of the challenge. It seems that we have to come to terms with if we want to understand the value of the closed string field theory action when it is not zero. Um, so, okay, so maybe just a few more before I end, just a few more comments on why this is important. Okay, so the action is. Okay. It's an important thing in general in physics, um, but the, uh, the thing that uh, one thing where you really want to know the action is uh, in uh, um, in studying uh, the physics of closed string packing and compensation. So um, so here. Uh, if you have a time independent uh, vacuum or field configuration, the action should be proportional to the energy. Okay? So in some sense, when we're computing the action in closed string field theory or not in, any other, in another theory, what we're doing is we're computing the energy of the vacuum. Uh, when we compute the on-shell action, we're computing uh, the, the energy of that vacuum configuration. 
So um, in string theory, uh, uh, this uh, this uh, what what you would like to do in some sense is find the uh, the vacuum which minimizes the energy. So the one which minimizes the energy should be the best vacuum for physics, right? So, um, so, uh, so that means we will, so for that reason, the value of the Anshah action is important in string theory. So, uh, okay, now the fact that it is zero for compact target spaces means that all vacua that you could possibly think of have the same energy. So they're all on the same level, it would appear, okay. <laughs> Uh, so that, that is a little bit confusing. So especially if you think about uh, uh, in, in, uh, in bosonic string theory, the, the closed string has a tachyon in its spectrum. So if you quantize a closed string uh, 26 dimensional flat space, part of its, uh, one of its quantum states represents an instability of space time, okay, through this tachyon. And you want, because the, the space time is unstable, it should be trying to fall to a lower energy state. Okay. So it should be trying to fall to a state with an action which is less than that of your original action. But this argument shows that that's not possible. So uh, in, in the, the bulk tachyon of the string, of the bosonic string, this one, this tachyon does not have an endpoint, at least on compact target spaces, which brings you to an energy configuration which is any lower than the one that you started with. Okay, so it's interesting to think about exactly what that means. Does that mean that the tachyon rolls and it just rolls forever and it never comes to any resolution? Or does it mean that, uh, okay, like, Okay, these are just speculations, but it's kind of a weird fact and contrast with, uh, it really contrasts with, uh, with the nature of this problem for uh, tachyon condensation in d brain systems, uh, where, uh, where the uh, open string tachyon represents an instability of the d brain. And what's this instability? And this instability can play itself out and you can find the vacuum, which is a state of lower energy. So for the closed string, it doesn't seem this is possible, um, or at least on compact target spaces. So that means that if you really want to understand, it suggests that if you really want to understand uh, the configuration space of string theory and what is the best uh, lowest energy configuration, you need to consider string backgrounds which are non-compact and understand uh, what the boundary contributions to this equation are, okay? And that, that's basically the, uh, so the, this preprint ed ended with this challenge, which is basically to understand what these boundary contributions are. And uh, if we can, that's not much, but it seems like a step in the right direction. And it's just a very longstanding, fundamental problem in, uh, in string theory. So, okay, so thank you very much for a very nice talk. And please, uh, if you have any questions, ask them. Maybe I would have a question about the uh, uh, your, your further uh, steps. Um, do you think about uh, any specific uh, non-compact of the ground, or is it? Uh, uh, well, there's certain backgrounds which are known by other for other reasons are expected to have non-zero action. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, strings in ADS three, it's known through holographic duality that the action should be non-zero, but in fact, nobody knows how to compute it. Okay, so there are people. Okay, this topic is actually 
uh, somehow coincidentally rather topical. Uh, that is, there, there are people who are beginning to think about related questions. And one of these questions is if you can figure out a way to compute uh, the vacuum sphere amplitude in string theory, okay? And so in principle, the value of this on-shell action should correspond to the amplitude on a sphere with no vertex operator insertions, with no states, with no asymptotic states. So the problem is that this uh, object appears to be very ambiguous when it, if you try to approach it from, from, the, from the point of view of uh, ordinary, uh, uh, from the point of view of the Polyakov path integral, ordinary string theory, if you try to compute this, then it's not clear how to do it unambiguously. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, there was some recent work uh, which managed to compute this sphere amplitude uh, uh, in, in the context of a certain uh, non-critical string theory. Okay, in the case of uh, flat space, for example, it's not known that this sphere amplitude is zero, but it's expected to be zero based on results from the low energy effective field theory. Um, and for strings in ADS3, it's, it's also expected to be non-zero based on holographic duality, but nobody, but nobody knows first principles string theory derivation of this result. Um, another, background which is interesting uh, from this point of view is uh, our, our, our certain uh, orbifolds of uh, 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 a, a uh, and so if you consider a string if you consider closed strings on a cone and this cone has certain deficit angle uh, then and then you have a conformal background, and there's also a tachyon which lives at the apex of this cone, which indicates that this background is unstable. So this background, I would expect that this background uh, may have non-zero action, and that if you allow the tachyon on the apex of the cone to condense, you will find another another background with an action which is less. Okay, but the but the action in this case, uh, is uh, nobody knows how nobody knows how to compute this action, and uh, it would be uh, its non-zero value would be the result of the fact that the uh, orbital fold is uh, non-compact. Quite surprised that you know, they don't know how to do it in the Minkowski. Yes, yeah, so in Minkowski space time, this, uh, I guess people don't know how to compute. I, I think there are, the problem is that, uh, okay, if you try to treat the sphere amplitude, there are, there's kind of a divergence which originates from integrating the sphere over the entirety of space time, depending on where the sphere is located. And there's also an additional divergence which comes from integrating over uh, the conformal killing group. Um, so you have to divide by the volume of the conformal killing group uh, on the sphere to get the amplitude and that volume is infinite. So, you're, so the, the amplitude is basically expressed as infinity over infinity. And then uh, some people argue that, okay, this infinity is bigger than that one. So the answer is zero. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but in some situations, the infinities apparently can be comparable and cancel to give a non-zero value. So, uh, uh, yeah, so that, that, yeah, so that's, yeah so, the, yeah, so the situation with closed string tachyon condensation is really quite mysterious. Uh, we don't really even have expect, real expectations, rigorous expectations on what this, the value of this action should be in the non-compact case. Did you have a uh, remark? So I often have heard this mathematician on conferences on, on the Stromenko model, 
uh, for a string theory. That is, is it also the Stroninger model uh, uh, present in this uh, possible action S? I'm not sure what you mean uh, by Stroninger model. There are local fields. There are also some uh, fields equations for um, for gravity, for symmetric tensor, for anti-symmetric tensor, a B, and for dilatons. But uh, in these cases, in many in the these solutions of the minimal action were known. Uh -huh. In many cases, up to dimension ten. But I'm not expert on it, so I know I must admit that uh, it was also in positive definite uh, signature. Uh, so I don't know much. Uh, 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 negative. Uh, no, no, I'm, not, negative. I'm not totally sure what model you're referring to. It just sounds kind of effective field theory. Uh, I don't. I don't remember the equations there. So I don't know. There's just some action for these fields, uh, and so I guess that sounds like the it's going to be effective string effective action, which depends on basically the massless fields of the of string theory and and the uh, massive fields, which are which you keep track of in string field theory, but. Not an effective field theory. Yeah. Well, so I integrate it out. Yeah, somehow. I was surprised that they knew explicit solutions for the uh, zero variation. So that's quite, I was quite surprised that it's possible to make explicit solutions to these. Okay. So, well, in, in effective field theory, the, um, in the equations of motion are basically Einstein equations coupled to matter. So in that sense, the uh, the uh, okay, certainly some things are known about such solutions. Um, I'm not totally sure I, I know what one we are talking about, so, but uh, so in the case of the closed string field theory action, such essentially there are no solutions which are known exactly um, because there are just too many. It's too difficult to solve these field equations and to even compute the action is extremely involved. But uh, there are kind of approximate solutions uh, which for uh, tachyon condensation on this overfold, which I was talking about earlier. Approximate meaning uh, uh, you basically uh, truncate the action to ignore all the massive fields and you just keep a few of the tactile fields you can solve that the equations approximately and see and see uh, uh, see a new vacuum which decreases the uh, the deficit angle of the compass in the way i have a very basic question so you said that bergman and zubak found uh -huh. that Shifting the constant mode of a dilaton and at the same time performing a field redefinition uh, was changing the um, overall normalization of the action. And from that, you also said that, that therefore there is an infinitesimal transformation of the closed string field. Uh -huh. So I fail to see how this is how the shifting plus the field redefinition is an infinitesimal transformation. Oh, so there there were a couple of statements there. Uh, the first statement that I made about Bergman is Liebach. This is in principle a finite statement, though they only discuss the infinitesimal case. Mm -hmm. But you can get the finite state statement by just exponentiation of the infinitesimal mm -hmm. case. So if you have an infinitesimal field redefinition, which shifts the deal, an infinitesimal variation, which shifts the dilaton and does an infinitesimal field redefinition. You exponentiate okay. that, that's going to be a finite field redefinition where the dilaton is shifted and the string field is also redefined. So, uh, yeah. So to be infinitesimal, you mean that the coupling constant is infinite in this case? No, no, that an infinitesimal change of the string field result, translates into an infinitesimal change of the coupling constant. So we're so recall that in that equation, which is probably you know, up there, you see the S is evaluated on phi plus epsilon delta yes. phi. 
is one plus epsilon. That's so that one plus epsilon arises from the infinitesimal change of the uh, of the uh, coupling constant, which multiplies the action. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, the so this D in my two here that's uh, related to the constant part of the Lidlton field, but what is it as a string field? What was, uh, as a uh, uh, I think it's like uh, um, C1, C minus 1. Okay, on the, it's, it's on the, 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 the ghost ghost part of the Lidlton field. This is the ghost field one. Okay, so I'm not making these, uh, these distinctions. <laughs> yeah, so it's a ghost eloton somehow. The ghost eloton is a universal state, so it exists for all string backgrounds. And so in some sense, that is the thing that is naturally associated with the string coupling constant. Okay. And then there are the matter deltons and various other deltons definitions you know, that we can put together. Uh, and, uh, but uh, somehow, this is the, the ghost deltons. Okay. Yeah, so their statement is in fact really the uh, the real result. <laughs> okay, uh, the, this preprint was really just noting that their result implied this obviously very important statement. Uh, so uh, it's somehow a very simple implication. Um, well, strange they did not <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I think maybe part of the reason was that, um, you know, this, this is something that I'm surprised people haven't noticed before. So it's always yeah. a little bit, uh, I was a little bit hesitant to, to post this preprint, but apparently. It's something that's so elementary that it just wasn't noticed. But I guess one thing that might, uh, for Bergman and Zwiebach, uh their coupling constant that uh, there was just a, a the phenomenon was hidden in a trivial way by the fact that they were writing the action such that the coupling constant multiplied the vertices in yeah, yeah. So if the coupling constant didn't appear as an overall plan vector, yeah. right? So their result actually shifted the coupling constant for that case. And then for this paper, I, you, you can just make a, a little bit of a twist to their argument and uh, get a slightly different field redefinition, which, mm -hmm. which, which accomplishes this. And they were also, I think, really focused on uh, trying to understand uh, the dilettante, uh, uh, the dilettante theorem at the at the level of the quantum string field theory. So they were also thinking about loops and uh, and uh, homotopy algebras. And there you can, and there are these uh, these kappa. Uh, Multiplicative factors can't be just canceled out by normalizing the string field. So they probably just were, were, they were not thinking about doing mm -hmm. such a thing. And they were just, I think, probably not very interested in the, in the classical statement of this theorem. They wanted to do it for full generality for the kind of quantum theory. So, um, so I ask you this equation is S. Uh, and the current uh, the bracket is it is it some some whole standard in uh, physics to demand this? What is S phi plus epsilon the delta phi is one plus epsilon no. s phi? No, this is not standard. This is a non-trivial statement. This is the statement that the coupling constant in string theory mm -hmm. is dynamical. So this is not something that you expect to hold in a general theory at all. This is a very special property that follows from the uniqueness of yeah. string theory. So this is a very deep, non-trivial. Mathematically, 
then you obtain S phi plus epsilon delta phi minus S phi is epsilon S phi. You divide by epsilon. Uh -huh. And you say if the limit of epsilon goes to zero, for epsilon goes to zero exists, it means that the action action S has fresh air differential. And the fresh air differential of S equals to S. Just by the surprising equation, D S is S. Yes, I know. Yeah, this is something. And then S equals. So that's essentially. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a delta phi. Yes, if you if you prefer, you can write this as as dot S equals S. Yes. So at least for delta phi. Yes. For for this particular so, delta, which yeah. implements this deleton shift and this homogeneous field definition, so that looks kind of like I don't know, yeah, this is like e to the x. The solution yeah, is e to the x or something. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that's interesting. You, know, you could somehow, uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay, I don't know. About for shade differentials. No, these are names for the total differentials in uh, our infinite dimensions. Uh, yeah, so it's only made in the R3, 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 R3
uh, I think really in the non-compact case, uh, when the action is not zero, which is somehow an interesting case, we really, there's really a lot, there, the results of this paper really bring some uncertainty as to uh, whether the present formulation of closed string field theory is even correct. So in that case, uh, relations like this or even L squared equals zero, I think one would have to think about it from scratch, how, 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 the, how the action needs to be modified and, uh, and how, to inter how to understand this gauge invariance. Um, it's very, uh, it's a very challenging problem. It seems right now. Uh, the, yeah. So there's not much to go on in the literature to tell you how you should approach adding bound, uh, accounting for boundary terms in the in the action, or how you should formulate boundary terms in the closed string field degree action. So. Um, Yeah. So, would you expect that a boundary term in the action would be necessary to have a defined additional principle? Like, uh, equivalently, this whole GR, we need this talking term? Maybe, but I, I am skeptical that that's the right way to think about it because GR is a second derivative theory. And one way you understand the addition of this given talking boundary term is that. It's necessary to ensure that the uh, Einstein Hilbert action is really uh, a function of the metric and its first derivatives only. Okay, so that's one way to understand how this given given talking term comes, comes about. But in string theory, the string, uh, you know, the action depends on all derivatives of the string field. In fact, it depends non locally on the string field. And there's no way you can add a boundary term which is going to change that. Okay, so. You have to you have to you have to think about it from some other from some other point of view. And I think I don't really uh, this moment I don't really have a, a good uh, feeling for how to proceed. But the way the way you know in the in the paper the way that you that you the way that I argued that. Uh, the boundary term is needed is because uh, if if the uh, action is non-zero on the back end you're considering, then this equation should be replaced by an inhomogeneous term, where this is the action of your reference background. Um, and uh, and uh, you can tell from the just from the fact that the uh, um, that the closed string field theory in action uh, starts at quadratic order, that is in the second powers of the string field and higher, you know that this equation could never arise from closed string field theories. It's presently formulated. So you need this, uh, you need to modify the, if the action is not zero when the closed string at the vacuum where the closed string field vanishes, you know that uh, that that the, uh, the action needs to be that you have to change the action, but you have to correct the action by a boundary term. Okay, and uh, yeah, so and that boundary term is what is it, uh, this boundary term will be a tadpole vertex, which will allow you to account for uh, for this inhomogeneous term. Arising from the Delton variation, so that that's a little bit more detail. Of the, it's so in the okay, yeah. So in the non-compact case, I think it's really an interesting case, and just from the results of this preprint, you can see that something really interesting and not easy. Interesting is going on, and it's not going to be uh, trivial to figure figure out how to deal with this consistently. Um, Okay, any other questions? If not, uh, we uh, thank the speaker again.